Okay, I think we'll go ahead and uh, and start. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Payne and I'm the director of the Bronx County Historical Society. I'm really great to see uh, um, all of you here so far and looking forward to seeing who else joins us tonight. Um, and really thank you to all of us for all of you for joining us for the annual spring lecture series in Bronx history. Um, this is something that we plan to do um, from here on out. This is the inaugural lecture in this series this year, um, and we'll be doing them annually. Um, so very thrilled to have all of you with us tonight. Um, and this year's topic is a particularly pertinent one, um, both historically and in our present moment. Um, and it is on uh, the Bronx fires, and there'll be two parts to the lecture. Um, the first part tonight is entitled Public Policy is Hate Crime, the 1970s Fire Epidemic. And we'll have one next Tuesday as well, April 18th, entitled Consequences of the 1970s Fire Epidemic and the Bronx's Future. Both sessions will include around 45 minutes of lecture, and we'll leave around the same amount of time for Q&A and discussion. So really hoping that there'll be a robust discussion around um, uh, what doctors Wa Wallace share with us tonight um, and very happy to have them with us. So before they begin, I'd just like to introduce our lecturers, um, our two lecturers, very, very happy to have them here. Um, first, Dr. Deborah Wallace. Uh, Dr. Deborah Wallace received the PhD in ecology from Columbia University in 1971 and a mini residency certificate in epidemiology from Mount Sinai Department of Occupational and Environmental Medicine in 1980. She was part of the pioneers of environmental impact assessment in the 1970s in her position as manager of biological studies, first for Con Edison and then for the New York State Power Authority. She transferred environmental and ecological analytical approaches to urban and public health studies in the 1970s. She's held multiple positions at the Center of, for the Biology of Natural Systems at Queens College and for nearly 20 years at Consumers Union. Although now formally retired, she continues to acquire and analyze patterns of urban processes and their public health consequences. With her husband and co-worker, Dr. Wallace, um, she has studied the 1970s fire epidemic, its causes and consequences for almost 50 years. Among various publications on this topic and related matters, they co-authored A Plague on Your Houses, How New York City Was Burned Down and National Public Health Crumbled, um, published in 1998 by Verso Books um, and still available uh, on the Verso Books website now and in various bookstores as well. Our second lecturer is Dr. Roderick Wallace. Dr. Roderick Wallace is a research scientist in the Division of Epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, affiliated with the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. He has an undergraduate degree in mathematics and a PhD in physics from Columbia and completed postdoctoral training in epidemiology at Rutgers. He has worked as a public interest lobbyist conducting 20 years of empirical studies of fire service deployment in New York City and received an investigator award in health policy research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In addition to material on public health and public policy, he has authored peer reviewed studies modeling evolutionary process and heterodox economics, as well as quantitative analyses of institutional and machine cognition. He also publishes and has received awards in the military science field. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Deborah Wallace and Dr. Roderick Wallace for uh, sharing your findings with us, uh, your really decades of research with us um, tonight and next Tuesday. And we look forward to, um, forward to your insights, look forward to the discussions that these will spawn um, and grateful for you for being here. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the screen sharing ability to you if you want to um, go ahead and share your slides. Okay, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, to spout off this evening. Um, we're going to start right away with hate crime number one. Where did it go? No. There we go. 
okay. It's always a problem with these little technologies. <clears throat> um, in the 1930s, the Bronx had been one of the most uh, politically engaged and prosperous counties of the country during the Great Depression. All this was turned upside down in 1938, first by the publication of the redlining maps from the Federal Housing Administration. The red areas on the map were denied federally backed capital to keep up the buildings. And so these areas in red were consigned to having deteriorating buildings because they could not, the property owners could not get capital. Um, although the main targets uh, with respect to ethnicity of the redlining were African Americans and Mexicans, in the Bronx, they were radical Jews who lived especially in the South and Central Bronx. Keep in mind the South and Central Bronx redlined area. In addition, in 1938, New York State got a new constitution. It had an article on housing, ostensibly to help improve the housing of the poor. But what it did was to set the state up for urban renewal. Under this constitution, the governments of state and, and local levels could identify blighted areas take them uh, under eminent domain and level the buildings and rebuild. So this was essentially urban renewal. In 1949, the federal government provided funding to do just that and urban renewal, which is hate crime number two, uh, was instituted and led by Robert Moses famously. More homes were destroyed under urban renewal in the 1950s and 60s than were built. People were evicted from their communities. Highways were built that segregated these communities from other areas. And public housing projects that segregated people were built in the areas of uh, communities of color. Additionally, the Bronx suffered from the dumping of refugees from urban renewal in other boroughs. Uh, so the people who had lived where Lincoln Center now is, it had been known as San Juan Hill. They were dumped into the Bronx in the 1960s. And this is where urban renewal occurred in the Bronx. This is from a wonderful website called Segregation by Design. And there's the Cross Bronx Expressway that Moses had built to segregate this area from the rest of the Bronx. The outfall of urban renewal in terms of community destruction and the inability of communities, of the unraveled communities to control antisocial behavior was so grave that organized religion uh, took a stand against urban renewal. It was politically poisoned by the late 1960s. So something continued to have to be done uh, that wasn't urban renewal, but that still kept communities of color from organizing and voting. The Lindsay administration and the Rand Corporation got together and formed the New York City Rand Institute, a quasi-governmental agency that was not accountable to the, the voters. One of the first actions of New York City Rand Institute was to help Daniel Moynihan draft the famous benign neglect memo. This memo, the purpose of the memo was ostensibly to uh, brief President Nixon and the American public about the status of the Negro outside the South. And it's full of lies. 
It asserts in the first paragraph that the American Negro is making extraordinary progress. And to support the assertion, Moynihan listed a lot of alternative reality data about this progress. He stated a third, 32% of all families of Negro and other races earned $8,000 or more in 1968, compared in constant dollars with 15% in 1960. In other words, he used the entire population of American families to generate the comparison, but implied that it applied to Negro families only. He further misled with statements about the comparative income of Black versus white young families. Quote, outside the South, young husband and wife Negro families have 99% the income of whites. This has never been true. He contradicted this statement in the following paragraph. Income reflects employment, and this changed dramatically in the 1960s. Blacks continued to have twice the unemployment rate of whites. To further the confusion, he stated, in 1969, the rate, that is the unemployment rate, for married men of Negro and other races was only 2.5%. So again, he conflated the national data with those for Blacks and implied that Blacks have wonderful household economics. The beginning of the benign neglect memo implied that Blacks generally prospered and that poor Blacks were caught up in pathologies such as female-headed households. Quote, increasingly the problem of Negro poverty is the problem of the female-headed family, unquote. Thus the plight of Northern Blacks is their own fault and stems from family pathology, not from racism. Now, later in the memo, uh, Moynihan used data that were given him by the New York City Rand Institute on New York alarm rates and fire rates. He conflated the alarm rates with fire rates, the fire rates with arson. So he supported his accusation of pathological community by accusing poor neighborhoods of color of committing frequent arson. This accusation led to the conclusion that these communities should be ignored hence benign neglect. The memo uh, signaled open season on communities of color outside the South. Now, in New York City, Roger Starr was a real estate industry's intellectual and created plan shrinkage to apply benign neglect to New York City. In the, 19, the late 1960s, the fire service unions won a case against the city uh, in front of the New York State Public Employees Relations Board because the workload in high fire incidents areas was getting very high. And the city was forced to open 16 fire companies in high fire incidence areas. And later Rod will show you the wonderful effect of opening those companies. But now the city was faced with these communities being stabilized and getting organized. So they had to do something. And the Rand Corporation uh, helped them. First, they experimented in the Bronx with changes in how many fire engines and ladders were sent to alarms. They had a scheme called adaptive response. So during peak fire periods in the ghettos, on, instead of three engines and two ladders being sent, only two engines and one ladder were sent. They also sent only one engine to a, an alarm at the new voice fireboxes if there was no voice contact. So already, the service was being whittled back without closing any fire companies. But finally, they found a way to close fire companies. They did this first by redefining how to judge the quality of fire service. Instead of looking at fire damage, civilian uh, injuries and fire deaths, firefighter injuries and deaths. And I said, it's the response time 
of the first arriving engine company that we're going to take as the measure of fire service. And so they were able to rig, to game this system by creating fake models of response time. Uh, this model here is called the resource allocation model. It says that response time equals a constant that depends on the velocity of the fire vehicle times the square root of the area divided by the available fire companies. That is the total companies minus the unavailable companies. And this is the model with only four parameters uh, to rig up response time. This is the model that was used to cut fire companies in 1972 and two rounds of cuts in 1974. These cuts heavily affected the Bronx. In 1975, they gave us another model. The resource allocation model in 1975 and thereafter uh, was used to pinpoint which area would be cut. But this other model, the firehouse siting model, pinpointed the exact company within the area to be cut. This also had to do with response time. This is called the, the time to the distance. And this is the distance between the firehouse and the firebox, not even the distance between the firehouse and the fire. If the distance between those two points was equal to or smaller than two times the distance to cruise velocity of the fire unit, this upper equation was used two times the square root of the distance divided by acceleration rate. If it was more than twice the distance to cruise velocity, this lower equation was used. Cruise velocity divided by acceleration plus the distance divided by cruise velocity. Now, the, the full critique of why these models are garbage, you can find in our book, uh, A Plague on Your Houses, How New York City Was Burned Down and National Public Health was Public Health Crumbled. We don't have time to go into the details, but I thought it was important for you to see that very few parameters were in these models. Now, during 72 through 74, there were policies that increased the size of fires and the alarm rates. Of course, the closing and moving the companies from the high fire incidence areas. The sending of one engine to a no voice contact on these telephone fireboxes. Sending less than standard responses to ghetto alarms. Staffing reduction, uh, five to four on engines and six to five on ladders. Reliance on firefighters tired from mandatory overtime. Understaffing in the dispatching centers, which delayed response. Reduction by one engine in the standard response from three engines to two engines. Uh, not allowing the battalion chiefs and dispatchers to automatically call higher alarms, but make them special call units one by one in the context of a growing big fire. Cuts in trash collection leading to more trash fires. Cuts in building inspections leading to more fire violations. Understaffing of the fire marshals. No more inspection for repair of fire damage contributing to building abandonment and cuts in hydrant inspection and repair increasing percent of defective hydrants. Now, Rand itself published a study that compared the firehouse siting model with actual data. This is data from Trenton, New Jersey. The line on the graph, this graphs the travel time against the distance in miles. The line is the predicted response time according to the model. The actual data points are the real response time. After 0.31 miles, which is less than a third of a mile, not very far, the whole system blows up. And the 
predicted response time cannot describe what's going on here. So people who are living just even a mile uh, away from the firehouse are getting response times one to two minutes greater than the predicted average. This is like, this is as if New Orleans would decide to build a levee that was good for only the average flow of the Mississippi and not the 100 year flood. And we know what happened when the 100 year flood came to New Orleans. Now, the fire department saw something was terribly wrong with the engine response time. The ladders, they didn't monitor so carefully. So when the ladders were cut in 75, they honestly showed an increase in the estimated response time by their way of estimating. But they falsified engine response time because that was how they were judging the quality of fire service. A perfect straight line, which is impossible. As the units were cut, the response time, according to this, got smaller and smaller. And this is part of the, the misleading of the public and the falsification of, of city records by the fire department to keep up the cuts in fire service. All right, where were the units cut in the Bronx? And this is where the units were cut between 1972 and the present. Uh, the Bs are for battalions. Those were cut later in the 1990s. But the Es, which are the engines and the L, the ladders, the S is squads. Squads are uh, extra manpower units that are called in for uh, where you have a lot of fires going on or, or large fires. So the same area that was hit by redlining, that was hit by urban renewal, was hit by the con a huge concentration of closing of, of fire companies in the 1970s, between 72 and 76. Now, Rod is going to tell you the outfall of that. Let me start by saying why response time is not a good measure of fire service quality. It can be a good measure of ambulance service quality because you have to get the ambulance to the person, the person back to the hospital. So the response time for that kind of episode is important. For a burning building, you have to build the hospital around the patient as the patient is getting sicker at literally an explosive rate. That's why response time, whether it's model calculated or measured of the first responding unit is not an adequate measure of fire service quality. Fire service quality is measured by what you see is what you get. The burned out buildings, the deaths, the injuries. Now, when fire service is cut, a whole series of very strange behaviors kick in. Essentially, what you do is you trigger contagious urban decay. And contagious processes have certain characteristics. For example, this is a slide showing the periodicity of measles outbreaks in three large cities before the development of a measles vaccine. As you can see, uh, the bigger the city, the more rapid you get a new crop of children under three. Every time you get a crop of children under three before vaccination, you increase the number of susceptible individuals to, to the contagious spread of measles, you get a peak in measles. And you get recurrent peaks in measles epidemics. 
the bigger the city, the more rapid the recurrence. What we're going to argue is that fire and other housing related municipal services serve as a kind of immunization against contagious urban decay. So when you cut fire service, you allow contagious urban decay to go. For children every three years, for densely populated urban areas every 50 years, the redlining of 1938 essentially made the pre-war housing susceptible to contagious urban decay. What we're going to argue is that in the last 50 years, since the burning of the 1950s, the post-war housing in the Bronx and elsewhere has become susceptible to an outbreak of contagious urban decay. Let's talk about contagious urban decay using some data. Here we have on the <clears throat> vertical axis, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have year from 1959 to 1982. On the vertical axis, the solid lines are an index of fire damage, looking at the number of structural fires, number of all hands fires requiring five units and the and number of extra alarm assignments where you count a second alarm as one extra alarm assignment, a fifth alarm as four extra alarm assignments. And what you see starting 1960, 60, 61, by 1962 and 63, you saw a sudden rise in the damage index. This was met by a doubling of fire inspections from a half million to a million fire inspections. The, the dotted line represents the fire inspections. And what you see is the fire inspections leveled off the damage index. What's happening here is once you get visible fire damage on a block. You trigger behavioral changes. The landlords on the block panic. The tenants panic. The landlords begin cutting maintenance and milking the buildings in preparation for abandonment. What happens with people with various beefs to deal with instead of a shooting or a knifing or a beating, it's gasoline under the door. More fire damage triggers more fire damage, like a measles infection. From 1967 to 68, we see another rise in the fire damage index. At this point, the unions forced the city to open 16 new fire companies in second sections of existing firehouses in high fire incidents, high population density areas. That was the second intervention. And what you see is the damage index began going down. They were topping it off. They had it. At that point, city began closing fire companies using the RAND models, the, the travel time models, however you, you, you do them, are going to focus closings in neighborhoods that have a lot of fire companies close together. Now, in at the turn of the 20th century, a lot of fire companies were opened in high fire incidents high population density tenement neighborhoods because there were a lot of fires. So use a travel time model, you're going to close 
five companies in tenement neighborhoods that had been redlined and denied the resources needed to keep them up. And then you see fire damage breeds fire damage breeds fire damage breeds fire damage until neighborhoods collapse. In the process, people are the fire <clears throat> uh, companies are spending so much time putting out fires they can't do inspections. Inspections are important. The inspection system has collapsed. The, <clears throat> the, the fire department of the cuts that gave us this peak is the fire department we have now. This is a classic contagious process. Clearly, fire service levels act as immunization against fire contagion. Redlined buildings from 1938, largely the ones that burned. 50 years later, the post-war housing has aged out and is at risk for another wave of contagious urban decay. Now, what has arson got to do with this? Blame the victim. It's, it's as, as American as apple pie and violence. If you look at the data, if you look at hours, engine, structural fire work time for the South Central Bronx from 1971 to 82, what you see is first a peak in the occupied buildings. Then, subsequently, a secondary peak in vacant buildings that feeds back into the remaining occupied buildings until the neighborhood collapses. Now, Vacant buildings are just piles of rubble. People use them, people misuse them, people throw their cigarettes into a vacant building. Vacant buildings are piles of tinder. They're going to burn. If we look at Bushwick, Brooklyn, similarly, hours, engine, structural fire, work time, occupied, vacant. We see an even starker pattern from the same time period, 72 through 80. First, there's a peak, an initial peak in the occupied buildings. That begins to go down. Then you suddenly get the occurrence of fires in vacant buildings, which feeds back into the remaining occupied housing and the neighborhood collapses. We have a similar graph for uh, Brownsville. What happened? This is a map showing the percent of occupied housing loss, 1970 to 1980, by health areas in the Bronx. Health areas are aggregates of census tracts by which uh, health statistics are reported. And between 1970 and 1980, the darkened areas lost between 55 and 81 percent of their house of their occupied housing. That is the red line zone. The second district, third, a third to a half. So a, a third to 80 percent of the occupied housing in the previously red line district was lost. And again, look at the pattern of the closed fire companies. Italian squads, engines, 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 ladders. It's not difficult to go and predict what's going to burn. This is a model based on 1970 data, census data that predicts the loss of housing 
in health areas in the Bronx. Percent change is a function of a burn index. The burn index, 1970, rank the health areas. There were 338 of them in the city. Rank them by poverty. One, the richest, 338 poorest. Multiply that poverty number by the percent of badly overcrowded housing in the health area. Badly overcrowded housing, the percent of housing with more than 1.51 persons per room. That burn index predicted the 1970, based on 1970 data, that burn index predicted the 1970 to 1980 burnout. You don't need a heavy duty AI model to predict susceptibility. It's the intersection of poverty and overcrowding under the conditions of inadequate fire related municipal services. This is the redlined pre war housing. We've set it up for the post war housing. School transfers. This is the school year 1974, 1975. This is New York City data. Mobility analysis, Department of City Planning. <clears throat> this shows the migration patterns. So, 74, 75, massive displacement of population. When you displace population like this, you burn out third to 80% of the occupied housing. You disrupt children's learning. You disperse minority voting blocks. You disperse the social networks needed to socialize youth into the adult world of work and family. You disperse the drug gangs that had worked out deals and you trigger the crack wars. This is not just anecdotal. You can predict it. This is a graph for the Bronx school districts, community school districts in the Bronx, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Thousands of pupil transfers from Bronx school districts, 72 to 78. <clears throat> it's a function of the average hours of school district engine occupied structural fire work time from 1972 to 78. It's a straight line. And that's the map. Now, I want to read something to you. This is something called the Kirby Report. This is an excerpt from something called the Kirby Report. It was written by Deputy Chief Charles Kirby to John T. O'Hagan, March 1970. At present, the Bronx, which covers 13% of the city area and holds 18% of its populations, participates in 23% of the structural fires. More relevant than the actual percentages is the rate of rise of the borough of the Bronx between 1964 and 1968. While structural fires in the city rose 42%, the Bronx increased 70%. In the same period, non-structural fires in the city rose 75%, while in the Bronx, 95%. In both instances, the Bronx led all boroughs in percentage increases. A disturbing fact is that in no instance during this period can we find a clear indication of leveling in any area of the borough. He goes on to predict burnout. And he says, it is fortunate that many of the new additional fire units established over the past year will cover portions of this area, engine 41-2, engine 50-2, ladder 17-2, 27-2, 
et cetera, et cetera. These were the second sections that were opened. These were the second sections. These were closed by Rand in the first round. He goes on, the major increases in fire companies recently added to the Bronx will assist in absorbing a large part of the expected fire rise, et cetera, et cetera, the expected fire rise. There's a similar report called the Jonat Report for Bushwick based on Kirby's report. The fire rise was expected at the highest levels and the fire companies needed to contain it were closed. Okay, we have uh, we have completed our our presentation. Great, thank you very much, uh, Doctors Wallace, uh, and we have uh, a good solid amount of time for um, uh, Q and A and discussion um, from attendees. Uh, there's uh, a few questions already, and we'd like to encourage folks who are on this. To, um, to add to the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll basically just take the questions in the order um, that they arrive unless you know, it makes sense to maybe, maybe group ones together about similar things, but otherwise we'll just take them the question that uh, in the order that they arrive. So um, I'll go ahead and read them out for you all and then you can determine among yourselves which of you would like to, um, uh, to take the question or if both of you would. Uh, the very first question, oh, this is just a, a practical question. Will this Zoom be made available for later viewing? Yes, it will. Um, we'll send a recording of both this Zoom and next week's Zoom out to everyone who registered and feel free to share it with others as well, even if, if people didn't register, um, share freely the link that we send. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and resolve that one. So the two uh, questions that we have so far, I'll read the first one right now. Um, what is the rationale for uh, the New York Fire Department to support the cuts in fire service um, suggested by the RAND, uh, uh, RAND studies? In my experience, the fire department as well as the union protest vigorously, raising every possible reason not to cut fire response resources. So why? Um, was there not more uproar from the fire department at the time? Um, well, there was. The unions went to court. They went to federal court to try and try and stop the cuts. All the city had to do was show a square root sign to the judge. Under US law, you have to prove intent of discrimination. If you say, I have a square root sign which justifies closing kettle fire companies, you're done. The unions did fight and they lost. When citizen groups would complain the uh, the people in the fire department would make a square root sign and use the RAND model. In addition, the myth of arson was extremely powerful. If you were on one side of the division, it was landlord arson to milk out. If you were on the other side of the division, it was people burning out so they could get into public housing. Now, in the late 70s, I worked for the Fair Plan. That's, that was the, the, the poverty insurance company. And we would allow you to insure your building in the South Bronx or Bushwick for whatever you wanted, as long as you paid premium. If something happened, however, we would pay you according to the market value of the property 
what would be the market value of the last frame house on a burned out block in Bushwick in 1977. Didn't matter what you premium you paid. Landlords were not making money by burning their buildings. When the fire would, if, if a fire would occur on a, on a block and mark the block, then the landlords would begin milking. That's how, how they try to get their money out. And that would add to the contagious urban decay. But indeed, the unions did fight. And uh, they have been fighting. And uh, they were undercut by the square root sign. It was very effective. They were undercut by the arson myth. Because the arson myth pulled out public support for the unions. The arson myth is, myth is you know, funded groups in the Bronx still talk about the arson myth because that's the price of their funding. Now, the, the power of the RAND models is a warning to us about technocracy. They were shielded from any accountability to the public and their models dictated actions that the communities had no power over. So we're seeing other ways that technocracy is imposing uh, extreme discrimination. The uh, artificial intelligence uh, models are being used to deny bail uh, and probation, principally to Black and Latin American prisoners. This is, you know, the, the RAND models were an early warning about the dangers of technocracy and how our democracy is being whittled away. But if you go to a journal called AI and Ethics, it's a Springer journal, uh, there's a paper I wrote with the title, The Names Have Changed, But the Game's the Same. That's a quote from Malcolm X. And in it, I compare the use of AI to the use of the RAND models operation research. And it's interesting, the fire department now has an AI model. I mean, they're right up there with, with this stuff. So they've switched the argument from operations research 50 years ago to artificial intelligence now but we we do discuss this uh in in that in that paper uh ai is the new or ai will be used as the square root sign was used to bamboozle people regarding fire service levels that question Okay, so um, let me go ahead and uh, I'm just going to um, to stop the uh, screen sharing, by the way. Before okay. We... Okay. Um, okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, this is from uh, uh, Bill Kinsella. Uh, fascinating talk, thanks, and troubling. You showed RAND data from Newark and mentioned events in Brooklyn as well. That prompts my question. Were similar fire service models used throughout New York City and in other cities nationally? If so, how do policies and outcomes in New York City and the Bronx compare to other places where these methods were used? Is the case of the Bronx representative of something more general during the period, or is the Bronx a unique and especially strong case? Well, it wasn't just the Bronx, it was all over New York. It was Harlem, Lower Sider. Bushwick, Brownsville, East New York, South Jamaica in, in New York. In addition, uh, response time models, there, there were two sets of the RAND ones and Public Technology Incorporated. They were sent out nationally by uh, HUD. And uh, eventually in, in what, Jersey City, the the city hall burned the city down. Hall bur the city hall burned down. Yes, right. where they were used, areas burned down. Right now, it's fascinating. Um, the person responsible at HUD 
for the national dispersion of these models um, was uh, Donna Shalala. She was the director of the Municipal Assistance Corporation during the financial crisis in New York. And she strongly supported the use of these models in New York City. She proclaimed New York City as a laboratory for experimentation with these models. Then when she was appointed deputy commissioner of HUD, she spread those models nationally. And uh, there were many cities that took them up. And the results were analogous to what we've described. I mean, Great, okay. a lot of burned out cities in the 1970s and the 1980s, a lot. And the response time models were used as justification for either not improving fire service or for cutting it. Now, fire service is one of the pillars. You've got fire related and uh, urban decay related municipal services. But when you don't improve your fire service in in the midst of a bunch of fires uh, on the basis of some uh, square root sign models, uh, you're going to have national problems, and we indeed did. Okay, great. So we have, we have a lot of questions. Uh, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and 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 read the next one. This is from Mike Donowski. Uh, what was the effect of changes in insurance regulations after burnout on building owners' behavior? Um, was there motivation for arson removed? As I said, we wouldn't pay. I, I, was, a, I was the assistant to the president of the fair plan. My job was to look at this stuff. We wouldn't pay at the height of it. We would pay you the market value, no matter what you insured it for. Insured for a million bucks, we would charge two or three times the premium of the ordinary commercial fire insurance. And then we pay out based on market value. We won in court. You didn't make money. You made a little money. You made most of your money as soon as you saw the block burning, cutting maintenance and milking the building, which made the building more susceptible, which caused the next block to burn. But as far as making money from burning your building, it was not a major incentive. You, you made the money by milking the building. And that would be if you saw a building on the block that had visible fire damage, then you milk your building, stop maintaining it, it goes vacant. Uh, that's the phenomenon, the behavioral contagion. Uh, arson, it, it, it didn't pay well. Yeah, the, the outfall of the fire epidemic on top of the greater destruction of housing during urban renewal than building of housing right. was the current uh, housing famine. Right. And uh, that drove the, the cost of housing much higher, the cost to uh, the renter and the, uh, the co-op buyer. So the economics changed drastically for property owners. They could charge immense rents, uh, you know, to, to buy a co-op. The, the prices went sky high. So uh, the, the, fire, the uh, fire epidemic led to a real boon for the real estate industry. And uh, it's in their interest to, um, to keep allowing continuous erosion of the housing stock to, to reinforce right. this fire fan this housing famine so the post-war housing now is aging out what better way to get rid of the post-war housing for a new round of development let the post-war housing burn down the way the redlined housing burned down and these guys make out like the bandits they are it is in their interest to allow 
another wave of burnout in the post-war, the aging post-war housing that many of us live in. All while complaining that their profits are so low uh, because of the pandemic. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so moving right along here, um, let's see, this next question is from Mina Jones. Do you believe that the discrimination at play in all of this process was uh, intentional or intrinsic? Let me do that. Okay. 1970, <laughs> Kenneth Gibson becomes the first black mayor of Newark. 1969, Herman Badillo is running for mayor from a South Bronx base. And in what, 1973, he almost beats B. In 1970, you get black mayors of uh, Cleveland. Cleveland, of Detroit. In 1968, Martin Luther King is running demonstrations in Chicago. The enemy is at the gate. In 1971, you have the Kirby Report predicting the burnout of Badillo's voting base. Kirby enumerates fire companies necessary to hold that housing. Those fire companies are closed. Mm. It's called ethnic cleansing. In 1920, they literally bombed Tulsa, the black neighborhoods in Tulsa. 300 people died. The ethnic cleansing in New York over a 30 year period, according to our estimates, didn't kill 300 people. It probably killed 100,000. We'll be explaining that in detail in the next lecture. So we're talking about a dozen Srebrenica ethnic cleansings. Yes, it was deliberate, it was ethnic cleansing. But we also, when we got into the documents that were sent to us, we sued the fire department under the Freedom of Information Act in 1977. And among the documents was correspondence between Moynihan and the Rand Corporation. And we could see that yes, it was deliberate. Yes, they were focusing on the ethnicity of the neighborhoods. Absolutely. And one thing I'll just add, um, in some of our archival collections, we have at the Bronx Historical Society, the records of the Bronx Board of Trade. And in documents from the late 20s, 1930s, um, people are already predicting a major demographic shift in the Bronx. Um, and uh, and that is definitely a part of the early discussions about the potential routes for alleviating highway congestion in the Bronx. So, you know, there's there's still this kind of intentionality at play, even with, you know, city planning projects decades before some of the major um, uh, demographics are, you know, readily apparent uh, uh, to, to most folks and, and all of that. There's, you know, decades before folks start organizing in some of these cases, um, you know, our, our, there's already been a couple decades of, of intentional planning. Um, and I, I, it's infuriating to see that um, in this case as well, but very illuminating. Um, so here's another question uh, from Kurt Boone. Um, what happened to building owners' money? Did owners lose money or were they covered by fire insurance? Um, we wouldn't pay. I worked for the Fair Plan. I was the assistant to the president in 1977 and 78. We just didn't pay. We paid market value. What was, you know, you pay a lot of money for anything burns. You buy a frame house. You get a mortgage on your frame house. You keep it up. You pour stuff into it. The block burns, you're left, you get insurance from the fair plan. You think you're covered, you pay your premium, 
something happens, we won't pay according to what you invested in the building. We will pay according to the estimated market value of your of your of the last frame house on a burned out block. They lost the original owners lost. The big people made out like bandits. Yeah, they the real estate industry has a very long plan for for New York City. Um an example of of that plan is uh, Governor Hochul trying to declare all the area around Pennsylvania Station as blighted and take it for redevelopment. Um, they want big redevelopment for big bucks to come in. The small owners aren't part of this. They're left out. Uh, but our fates are being decided by the, the big real estate donors. The the guy who is a big donor to mayor, the mayor, and who was a principal in the real estate firm that owns the Twin Parks Towers where 17 people died because of multiple violations in that building. He's walking around. He's not going to spend a day in jail, even though he was part of that firm and that firm was responsible for all those deaths. They should have been charged with manslaughter. Okay, let's see. Uh, there's a couple of other questions related to um, that, that last question. So uh, we'll uh, kind of go to some other questions right now. Here's one. Um, uh, you, you talked about the re, uh, the kind of redistricting of schools and the pop, the student population shifts um, that played into all of this. Uh, how did that affect Co-op City and how does Co-op City in general fit into this whole picture if it does? Uh, it's, it's peripheral. Uh, certainly as the, the forced migration, I mean, you burn down one neighborhood, you kill two neighborhoods. You burn down, you kill the neighborhood that burns down, half the people move. You overcrowd the recipient neighborhood and the social networks there disintegrate. So the forced migration from the South into, in, into the, the Northwest Bronx broke in a certain sense, social networks, pre-existing social networks in two neighborhoods. Part of that went to displaced people. I mean, in, in Brooklyn, burning a bush of Browns or East New York destroyed the Jewish community in Flatbush. People moved into the suburbs. Uh, people moved from the, the Jewish neighborhoods in the Bronx into uh, Co-op City, but mostly north into Westchester County. Uh, since then, there's been turnover in Co-op City. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's highly mixed now. Uh, it's also suffering uh, a lot of structural degradation. It's in uh, there's a lot of gas leaks. Yeah, um, we don't know. We don't have data on the um, occupation in co-op in co-op city. Whether there there's doubling up the way there is in some of the other large housing projects across the Bronx, doubling up of the families because of the housing famine. So that's an open question. Yeah. In short, we don't really know. We know some, but but not enough to answer that question. Great. Uh, okay, let's see. This is um, this next question is from Vivian Vasquez Irizarry, um, who I think is still with us uh, um, in the attendees, uh, um, and is also uh, very very interested in this question. And for for those of you all who who haven't yet, you um, 
uh, should should check out her documentary on this as well. This is a question from Vivian. Your work has been extremely valuable in understanding the fires that destroyed the South Bronx. Uh, what are the most serious issues facing the Bronx today? Well, we're gonna show some of that in the next the next uh, session. Um, the Bronx is the unhealthiest county in all of New York State. And for example, this in nine in 2019, this before the pandemic, the citywide life expectancy was 82.6 years. In the Bronx, even the richest community districts, districts eight and 10, didn't even reach the citywide average. Their life expectancy was 81.8. So as an entire borough, we're in trouble because the conditions that are arising out of this succession of public policies are making all of us live in ways that are shaving our life uh, ex life expectancy, our health, our well-being, our public safety. So the the answer to the fact that we're the bottom of the health ladder for all of New York State is being met with demands for more access to health care. But that's not going to help us because that's kind of medicalizing uh, the roots of our problem. And it's going to make a lot of bucks for, for our hospital system. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's not going to help us. Medical care, like the Pentagon, is a kind of macro parasite. Uh, you're supposed to have a little medical care. Palliative care is the end of life. That's how it's done in the you know places like the Netherlands and and Sweden. Uh, you, you live a long life because you have good working and living conditions. Your parents had good working living conditions, and your grandparents. It's a three generation kind of kind of thing. Uh, healthcare is an epiphenomenon on the top of living and working conditions and the living and working conditions in the Bronx. Well, until we were gerrymandered, the Bronx had the poorest congressional district in the United States. And it, that, that, that got gerrymandered. Uh, that's not, you know, the poor, you know, poorer than Mississippi. Uh, we're not doing well. We're not going to do well. We're going to show in the next lecture how public health in the United States is a linear chain process. The chain for emerging infection is no stronger than the weakest link. We will show that with regard to the emergence of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the Bronx was the edge of the wedge, national, uh, locally, regionally and nationally. So you could even go to Mitch McConnell with this and say, look, this is a festering sore on your health. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a good lobbyist. And I don't have the money to get to Mitch McConnell. If I could get to Mitch McConnell, I could make this case. But, you know, it takes more than I have. Uh, uh, this next is um, more of a more of a comment, I think here, um, but I'll go ahead and read it. This is from Carol Ann Maletti, a wonderful scholarly and also a heartfelt retrospective. I grew up in the Bronx and was a school aged child when my family moved from Park Chester to Locust Point at the foot of the Throgs Neck Bridge. Too young to understand at that time, I recall the fire blazing next to a packed Yankee Stadium with Howard Cassell's snarky commentary. My father, who was a champion for protecting the remaining stock of housing as well as preservation and development, was horrified that, quote, the entire country is watching this, end quote. I eventually returned to work in the South Bronx as a public health nurse in the late 1980s, 
when there were more stray dogs in occupied buildings and retired in 2020, relieved to see a rena renaissance. Thank you for your hard work to help ensure this will not happen again. Okay. Um, okay, so the next question, uh, I'm gonna group a, a couple together here because they're related. Um, I'll, I'll read them both uh, and, um, and you can take them from there. So um, this first question, what was the response of the impacted communities? Um, and this next question, uh, Dr. Deborah Wallace mentioned that organized religion um, fought back against urban renewal. Um, how did community organizing in general help with the fight back? Um, and there's a, a question about how the Young Lords and groups like the Young Lords um, played into the fight back process as well. Let me say something you can, okay. Young Lords, when uh, the city stopped picking up the garbage, they put it in the streets and they burned it. Okay, the community groups, you have to be careful. One of the, you know, you, one of the things we studied was disasters and relief <clears throat> of disasters and the, the scientific literature on disaster relief. One of the essential measures in disaster relief is relief from the outside. Like when the tornadoes go through because of global warming, there is an effort from the outside to come in and provide relief. Bootstrap in the absence of such relief is largely ineffective. Okay, second, community groups in the Bronx that are currently funded still promulgate the myth of us. That's the price of their funding. That doesn't help. So community groups were knocked back. Uh, if you look at maps of voting, voter participation in New York City, in particular in the Bronx, the burned over zones never came back. This 50 years later, they do not vote. It's hard to say that the community groups, I mean, there were a lot of people who did a lot of work but there was no relief from the outside. The dispersal of minority voting blocks was a desired impact that persists to today. There has been no essential relief. There's been some, some reconstruction, but there's not been a reestablishment of the social networks and the political power that characterized the Bronx in 1938. It, you know, you to grow, you have to plant. There's been, the planting has been very careful. I mean, Badillo scared them. Okay, let's see. This next question is from Eileen Markey. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Was the lack of profitability of arson you're describing always true or only later into the crisis? And why did the fires stop? All right. Well, you couldn't get fire insurance under the ordinary, uh, from the ordinary companies. You had to go to the fair plan. And the fair plan right off just wouldn't pay. It would pay market value right from the beginning and one in court. Uh, why did the fires go down? You consumed all the, all the susceptibles. It's like you have a cohort of children under three without measles vaccination. The infections go up, and then as everybody gets it, the infections go down. Then you wait for another cohort of children under three, and you get a second wave. 
here the first wave was 50 years ago in the red line housing. What we have now is the aging out of the post-war housing that constitutes the new crop of children under three for the next wave of contagious urban decay. So it went out because everything was susceptible burned down. I mean, you, you know, you people have seen the, the pictures clear cut. That's where the fires went down. And it takes another 50 years for the new stand of housing to ripen. At, the fire service is at the same level it was when the first wave broke out. There's been no improvement. Yeah. Um, in, in 1970, the Bronx had 35 engine companies, 29 ladder companies, and three squads. We now have 30 engine companies, 27 ladders, and two squads. So we're down quite a bit, although the population now is greater than it was in 1970. Let's see this next question. Um, what personal connection sparked your interest in this area? Well, we had two connections. Uh, one, we live next to a firehouse. And some nut uh, was setting uh, the garbage on fire in the basement. One day, our fire company that was right next door was out uh, putting a fire out in an area whose company was closed. Okay, they, their range of service had been extended greatly and a fire was uh, occurred in the basement. Uh, it went up the elevator chute to the, the top floor, the smoke billowed out under the uh, ceiling of the top floor and started to come down. Um, and that was a very scary thing. Uh, so we knew that the cut in fire service, even though our unit was not cut itself, had affected our fire service. So that was one thing. Um, the second thing was um, at the time we were we had a group called uh, Scientists and Engineers for Social and Political Action. And that group was, uh, was picketing a weapons lab in Manhattan, Riverside Research Institute. And we found out about the electronic fireboxes that were being put in. Um, uh, Riverside Research was evaluating these fireboxes. Um, so we went to visit uh, the Uniform Firefighters Association, whose president at that time was Dick Vizzini. Vizzini clued us in about the about all of these service cuts, and that's how we got involved with the larger picture of, of the service cuts. Yeah, actually, he gave us a box full of the RAND reports that justified the cuts. And I took, I took them home. We took them home. Deborah read them. And she had been doing uh, work on natural populations of fish in the Hudson. And the RAND models were of poorer quality than the ecosystem models being used to model fish populations. And at that point, we thought there was something wrong. And let's see, this next question is from William Rodriguez. I read somewhere that I don't have the documentation that someone could buy a tax defaulted tenement for $10,000, pay 350 for an arsonist, and get 40,000 from insurance with no questions asked about the arson. Well, that's the urban legend. But as assistant to the president at the fair plan, we didn't pay. You got peanuts. We made sure you got peanuts. We cheated you. That's what big business does, and we were good at it. So uh, urban legend aside, 
there's more going on here. It's called ethnic cleansing. Well, the other the other thing about the arson thing. Toward the very end of the fire epidemic, there was an increase in arson. That's right. Because everyone could see that the fires weren't being serviced. And that was the only time when arson played any real role in the whole picture. It was toward the like 75 to 76 era. But building up to that, the Bronx had already suffered uh, extreme damage by that time. I, I remember a fire marshal at a hearing the city council who said baldly, oh, arson, that's a phenomenon of vacant buildings. Now, vacant buildings are piles of rubble waiting to go. People go in there and uh, act out various ways. Vacant buildings are going to burn. Uh, no way to stop them. Uh, yes, there was fire setting. I mean, I, I showed the curves of the first rise in occupied structural fire then a rise in vacant building structural fire that fed back into the remaining occupied buildings, and then the neighborhood collapses. That's the dynamic. It wasn't people just trying to make a few bucks. Okay, let's see this next question. Um, this is also uh, uh, a question about uh, Co-op city, which you all might or might not be able to um, address here, the BBC reported that Co-op City could not have been built in its marshland locale due to city regulations. Had not the developers first built Freedom Land with the intention to let that amusement park fail purposely, were they correct in that report? That's beyond, That's beyond, beyond our expertise. expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. We, do know, we do know that Co-op City has a terrible problem with sinking in the marshland, but uh, yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, let's see. This next uh, question, let me just try to boil it down here. So um, did, uh, uh, did the fire epidemic um, in the 1970s, did that uh, affect the behavior of property owners at all in the aftermath? Well, which property owners? The poor ones or the rich ones? The large corporations fed off the housing famine. I mean, we bought our co-op in Manhattan for 7,500 bucks. I'm not going to tell you what we sold it for. But the reason we got that was there was a housing famine. Uh, the big developers, they are making out like bandits off the housing famine. The little people get screwed. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, there are studies of this. There are academic studies of this in more detail. You can Google it. Hey, there, was, there was a hearing by the city council's committee on housing and buildings about um, the building code enforcement. And there does not seem to be a big shift in the behavior of the property owners who own uh, rental uh, units. Um, the the level of violations is fairly high and uh, the lack of staffing of the buildings department and of uh, HPD is allowing these violations to continue almost indefinitely. So the city is in dire straits as far as housing violations go. And this does not indicate that um, the, the property owners have reformed and, and are trying to do a wonderful, wonderful job. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, there's uh, two more questions for now from Eileen Markey, and then we'll see if there are additional questions. Um, so I'll, I'll ask both of Eileen's questions um, and uh, you can kind of take them in turn. So the first question from Eileen is, who benefits now from the continuation of the arson story? What foundations or funders are interested in promoting that story? Hey, the, the career risks within the fire department that are protecting the use of the RAN models uh, love the arson myth because the uh, they say, oh, if it's arson, we really can't keep the fire small. So it doesn't matter how many units we send. If it's arson, it's going to be a big fire. So they love that. Um, you have the the continual divide between the tenants and the landlords, where the landlords want to accuse the tenants of doing arson and the tenants want to accuse the landlords of doing arson. So there's that play that's continuing to go. Um, the, the big developers, uh, they find it convenient. Uh, if they want to buy a buy a set of of multiple dwellings and stop the maintenance there, they can blame the fires on arson. Um, okay, let's go through some of the numbers. Before the burnout, we had about five hundred homicides a year. After the burnout, where it became impossible to socialize young men into the adult world of work and family, you had a rise in the homicide rate from 500 to 2,000 a year. This went on for 20 years. That's 30,000 premature mortalities. You think that for everyone who died, someone else was badly injured and put on a different life course trajectory to premature mortality. In addition, as someone who worked in Freddie Ferrer's office put it, quote, plan shrinkage shotgun aids over the Bronx. This is something we're gonna discuss in the next meeting, next lecture. So you're talking about 100,000 premature mortalities in New York, the New York metro region, and nationally because of what was done to break the minority voting blocks. That's 100,000. Nobody wants that baby. So the myth of arson, you're talking a dozen Strebenitsas. You're talking 300 Tulsas. You're talking ethnic cleansing. Nobody wants that baby. Blame the victim. They did it themselves. The myth of arson, it's like the people who deny the Holocaust. It's Holocaust denial. It's our version. There's 100,000 premature mortalities spread, not just in New York. We're going to show the metro regional effects and the national effects. See, New York is at the peak of the US urban hierarchy, which is a very strong hierarchy. Something that happens in New York resonates down at least the, the 25 largest metro regions, 100 million people. So back in the interval calculation, 100,000 premature mortalities due to an ethnic cleansing program, our lords and masters who did that ethnic cleansing, are not going to give money to groups that talk about what was done to them. You have to sign on to the arson myth to get your money from our lords and masters. 
because 100,000 premature, premature mortalities, even in 20th century terms, that's pretty big. Yeah, the, the other thing is the, the arson myth began with the Moynihan memo. And its purpose was to stigmatize communities of color. And so continuing the arson myth, uh, conflating fires with arson continues to stigmatize those communities and justify their persecution. Okay, let's see this next question, also from Eileen. Can you talk at all about what role the fiscal crisis and especially the city and state's response to it played in the crisis in the Bronx? That was an excuse. That was one of, but the fire cuts began well before the fiscal crisis. The fire department was recognized before the fiscal crisis. The fire department was recognized as one, as the most efficient municipal service. And that's the one they cut first. Like we're talking about 72, 1972, the first company closings, 1974, 1975, uh, they just piled it on. They just, they used the fiscal crisis as an, the fire department was 2% of the city budget. You don't cut fire service. You don't. Good Lord. You know what? You're going to war and you're going to take one man off each machine gun nest? I mean, you know, you, you, you're you going to drop the guy who carries, who, who, you know, who carries the ammunition to the machine gun? I mean, that's what fire service is about. You don't cut fire service in a fiscal crisis. Well, the the fiscal crisis led to cuts in sanitation right. and building code enforcement. And those cuts just made everything much worse. Right. So uh, the, the fire epidemic peaked in 76 in the wake of the interaction between fire service cuts previous and what was happening in these other uh, these other services. Fair enough. Okay, let's see. Uh, two more questions, and then and then we'll we'll probably call it a night. After that, um, uh, there's there's been a lot of a uh, lot of great questions, and I know we have a whole uh, a whole session next Tuesday as well. Um, so this question, um, this next question, did they use the same methodology to determine the number and placement of fire departments? in white and more middle-class neighborhoods. What was the impact there? The, the neighborhoods that were cut that were not neighborhoods of color, the, the fire service that was cut that were not neighborhoods of color uh, were neighborhoods like um, Greenpoint, which was at that time heavily immigrant. Um, there was uh, Richmond Hills, which again was a very mixed, heavily immigrant neighborhood. These were neighborhoods that uh, were outside the mainstream, although they weren't largely neighborhoods of color. Um, but you didn't get cuts on the Upper East Side. You didn't get cuts in Fresh Meadows, Queens, or uh, the wealthy neighborhoods in Staten Island. Uh, those neighborhoods were totally untouched. So uh, that's another reason why we, uh, we concluded it was uh, an intentional focusing on neighborhoods they wished to dis disempower. And um, I'll just uh, add to that. This is, of course, looking ahead to next week as well. But you can, of course, see uh, almost exactly parallel trends, even in the mayor's preliminary budget that was put out in January with cultural institutions alone 
when you compare the proposed cuts for an institution like uh, the uh, the Metropolitan Museum uh, to the Museo del Barrio, um, or basically any small cultural institution in Harlem or the Bronx or um, you know other uh, similar areas around New York, uh, you know, like Museo del Barrio is proposed like a 53% cut. Um, you know, the Bronx Historical Society proposed 43% cut, you know, just like down, down the line, there's, there's similar kinds of priorities that are still at play in the budgets, uh, budgets that come out today, but we'll get to that next week. Um, and, and the final question, uh, it's a very interesting question. Has the RAND Corporation acknowledged their role in all of this, or did they ever acknowledge their role in all of this? Oh, they continue to be very proud of what they did. Uh, they consider it a great triumph. Uh, they they wrote books about it. So, you know, <laughs> they don't look on it as, as something to be ashamed of. Although when we went into the fire department records, we found a memo written by uh, Columbia University professor Edward Ignall, who was part of the RAND uh, Institute. It was called, How Much is a Minute of Response Time Worth? This was 1972. And he made criticisms of response time as an index. We made similar criticisms five years later when we published our book. They knew, but what do you say when large areas burn down? You don't buy that baby. That's not my baby. I didn't do it. You lie. You have to lie to keep your professional standing. They lie. They know it. They're not stupid. They're evil. There's a difference between evil and stupid. I mean, these are the people who did body count faking in Vietnam. So they're doing body count faking in the Bronx for 50 years. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much um, uh, to both of you, uh, uh, Doctors Wallace. Uh, I really enjoyed the lecture tonight. Um, uh, as uh, infuriating as as the topic uh, uh, and en enraging as as it is, um, but uh, it's important to set the record straight on this history. Um, and looking forward to our discussion next week and the lecture next week. Um, those of you who are still uh, still signed in, it'll be same time, same place. That is 7 p.m. Eastern virtually. Through Zoom, you'll receive the same reminder emails that you did this week, and we look forward to our conversation then. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>